right? Okay, so when we look at nucleophilic substitution today, uh, okay, that's the main purpose of today's lesson. Okay, there are actually two types of nucleophilic sub. Okay, it's split into both SN1 and SN2 nucleophilic substitution. Okay, what do they even stand for? Okay, we slowly break it down. Okay, the part of today's lesson will be on this. Okay, so first of all, uh, we're going to be touching on SN2 nucleo sub. Okay, and there are five different properties as you can see at the bottom of that page. I'm not going to go over the properties in order. I'm just going to list down whatever that is important that comes to mind. Okay, first of all, uh, guys, when you see the word SN2, I just need you guys to be very clear what the two stands for. Any guesses? Okay, some of you guys again okay, may have a few guesses like two steps or whatnot, but I really need you guys to write this down first. The two in SN2 refers uh, to having two reactants in the slow step. So there's going to be some kinetics involved, uh, because I mentioned slow step, right? Okay, some kinetics. Okay, and SN2, the two, uh, please do not get confused with what the two represents. It could represent a whole load of stuff, uh, okay, but this is the most important one. Okay? Okay, but on the other hand, uh, guys, okay, the next thing that we're going to look at is the rate equation. Okay, since we are on the topic of slow step. Okay, so what it has are the two reactants are both the halogeno alkane and obviously the neutral sum because it's neutral sum, right? Okay, so look something like this. Next, this is actually a one step reaction. Later on, we will explain why. Okay, but for now, you just need to know as like opposites. SN2 is just a one step reaction. Okay, so do not remember it by the number of steps. Huh? That's the most important part. Okay, so I've covered like which points we are trying to keep track for. Okay, the next thing I need to know huh, is this. SN2 nucleosub uh, is favored by primary halogeno alkenes. So I remember saying at the previous lesson, uh, if you cannot identify primary, secondary, and tertiary, you might have a little bit of trouble identifying which kind of nucleosub it favors. Okay, so just put this first. I put the word favor uh, because, uh, guys, it is possible for other types to undergo SN2, but generally it is preferred by primary and so far. Okay, and the next thing that we're going to do is to draw the mechanism. You see, I'm not going to go over all five yet. Later, we'll come back to that. So, can okay, I turn over to page 21? The box over there, ignore you know the box at the bottom. That one's like kind of incomplete. What I need you guys to do now is to follow my nuclear sub process. Okay, again, what's the first thing you write when you draw a mechanism? Name, okay, write down the name first. Okay, don't write nuclear sub, huh? that one will be wrong. Okay, I need you to write the full thing. SN2 nucleophilic sub. If you fail to identify which type of nuclear sub, unfortunately, they will penalize you for the game. Okay, so you must be very clear. Usually, the question will give you clues as to which SN it undergoes, SN1 or 2. Okay? Now, what's going to happen here? I need you all to follow me very closely. SN2 has a lot of details you need to follow closely. Huh? Okay, the first thing you need to do is to draw this. Okay, uh, first of all, I always forget to warn you all. Okay, leave a little bit of space first on the left side, okay? And then draw what I'm going to draw first, okay? So leave a bit of space, then draw the fonts looking like this, exactly how it is shown up. So you can see, uh, this one is horizontal, and then everything else is like leaning towards the left-hand side. There's a reason why you have to draw it in this configuration. And you guys can also notice that I am drawing the stereochemical formula, because I'm going to be discussing the stereochemistry a bit later, okay? Next, uh, fill in the groups. Okay, the one that's on the horizontal plane here, uh, let's put in a uh, halogen. Okay, and then the rest uh, are your alkyl groups. As I mentioned, uh, it's favored by primary, so I'm only going to draw in one alkyl group, doesn't matter where you're drawing, you're just going to draw one to be. The rest are features. Now, just to clear up a bit of misconception, some of you guys tell me that, oh, okay, first of all, is this carbon chiral? Is it a chiral carbon? Does it have four different groups? Clearly not. Lah. But it doesn't matter. Chiral carbon, right? Okay, yes, some of y'all say that must draw the stereochemical formula. But it doesn't have to be chiral for you to draw stereochemical. It doesn't matter. As long as it's tetrahedral. Remember, a tetrahedral by itself, right? It's already a triple shape. Doesn't matter whether it's chiral or not. Okay. Now, why I ask y'all to leave a bit of space? It's because uh, the nucleophile must attack from behind. Later, I'll discuss that. It's part of the whole process. So draw OH minus. Remember, lone pair must be shown. Negative charge must be shown on oxygen. Okay, and guys, the nucleophile attack who again? Uh? Who does it attack? C. Okay, the C in the middle. Because why? How do you know that? Partial positive. 
this partial negative. Okay, so arrows from the loom bear, I want you all to come from behind. Uh, okay, you cannot attack from the front. It's just unfortunately part of the whole process. Okay, so you attack from behind like this. Then what happens? There's one more arrow to go. How many bonds are covered in the middle half right now? Okay, uh, including the new arrow, uh, it will be five bonds, right? How on earth are you going to form five bonds? You must maintain as four. So one of them is to break. Who? Who breaks? Who are you trying to substitute out of the way anyway? You're substituting the PR, right? So guys, this bond break already. The electrons just go towards PR. Okay, so two arrows over here. Don't forget the second one. That's what a lot of people need, right? So those are the arrows for the first step. Okay, a bit no space now. So let me just draw downwards. Okay, so the what I need you all to do next is to put here slow step. Why slow step? Is because we already said uh, there are two items in the reactor in the rate equation. The halogenal alkene and the nucleophile must be present. So now that both of these guys are present, uh, we put this as a slow step. Make sense? Next. Just follow what I'm going to draw now. Okay, this is what we call uh, the transition state. Some of you guys may be looking at this and go, what the hell is this, right? Okay. Let's look at what I'm going to draw first. Okay, I'll give you guys an example. But basically what's happening in this transition state uh, is this O will not really form a bond with carbon yet, and it doesn't really break the bond with PR yet. So how it looks like is like this. It has not formed the bond with carbon, but it also hasn't formed, it hasn't broken the bond with PR. So kind of like in the middle, who san who si, that kind of process. You can think of it this way. Uh. Imagine this is a girl, and then the girl is very unhappy with her boyfriend. The boyfriend is not giving her enough attention. So she wants to break up with the boyfriend. But before she breaks up, right, what would she do? She wouldn't just break up first, right? Okay, most, most girls, okay, what they would do is to go and find another guy first. Okay, in the meantime, uh, while finding another guy, right, then she will still consider whether to break up this guy or not. Okay, but once find a better guy already, right, ah, then she will break up. But usually this process isn't that simple. There will always be this Pusan Pusan state, right, where they haven't really gotten together yet, but they also haven't really broken up yet. That is the process in this case. Okay, so just in real life, uh, okay, this transition state is kind of like reflecting this process. Okay, just be, a, be, a, be very careful as to what we're going to draw here. Do you all see this? The solid bond is on the right, the dash bond is on the left. Now you all need to swap the order. The solid bond must be on the left, the dash bond must be on the right. Now the group still remain the same, although we're changing. There's a reason for this. I'm not asking you all to do all this for fun. Okay, later on, right, okay, everything will make sense. But this is the transition state, and guys, does this transition state have a charge? Can you tell me? Yes. Overall, transition state here, does it have a charge? And if so, what is the charge? Me again? Oh, nice. Is it good? Oh, nice. Yeah, you know. I'll, I'll, I'll eat a bit. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so guys, uh, we're going to look at the balancing of the equations, huh? Before that, right, there's an overall negative charge. You can see that because of the nucleophile, negative nucleophile. So over here, when they are together that time, right, you still must have the negative charge as well. Do not forget that. Okay. And then afterwards, okay, the transition state is clearly not the final product yet. So I'm going to draw the fast step now. Ah, but some of you guys uh, will probably see something. Slow step and fast step. Isn't that a two-step process? But I already said here, what? it's a one-step reaction. How come got slow and fast? Okay, it's because, uh, guys, you're going to treat it as this. Uh, it's the first time you're going to see a transition state. A transition state is a theoretical structure that doesn't actually exist. Okay, first you can take it down. Uh. Okay, it's a purely theoretical structure, a hy hypothetical structure that doesn't actually exist in real life. So you cannot actually produce this thing like and synthesize it. No. Okay, it's a purely hypothetical structure. So guys, and because of that, right, you still need to draw it, but you can treat it as one smooth step. Okay, it's one smooth step. Okay? Pay attention to how I'm going to draw the final product. So guys, eventually, uh, they're going to get out of this transition period. Eventually, the girl is going to decide to get together with a new person and break up with her current boyfriend. Okay, so she's going to get together with the, uh, with the OH. But you see, uh, Everything, right, just now was leaning towards the left, right? Now everything must be leaning towards the right. So I'm going to flip it like that. So everything will lean like this, like this, and like this. Can you see what's happening here? 
Just now all three bonds are leaning leftwards. Now all three bonds are leaning towards the right. Yeah, okay, all these small little details are, are what makes SN2 so troublesome to draw. Okay, but in the meantime, we get BR minus as well because the guy finally leaves and he gains an electron. Can you see that? This is the full process. It's about two. Sometimes, if you're lucky, there's three marks for this, but it's usually only two marks. Okay, but of course, we're not done with this. Okay, I'll be looking at some of the things here to discuss some of the other properties of SN2. I've only covered three out of five properties. Any questions here? All oh, good? Can I? Okay, so it's not important. Huh? Okay, guys, you see all the swapping of the bonds here, and then I flip from the left, flip to the right. Okay, this is the inversion of stereo chemistry. This is the fourth property, right, of SN2 nucleophilic sub you will invert the stereochemistry of compound. Why does it invert? Okay, it's because of the real side effect of the nucleophile. If you all notice right at the start here, I mentioned that the nucleophile must attack from behind. And by attacking from behind, uh, you will cause this entire thing to flip on its other end, and then it becomes on the right side. Like, uh, yeah, okay, basically leading towards the right. Okay? All because it attacks from behind. And as it attacks, uh, it starts the swap over here already. Some schools, they don't swap it here. They swap it only at the end. Doesn't matter. Okay, let's just keep it consistent. Let's swap it here first so that we don't forget. Okay? So that's another property. Real side attack of the new profile. All good? Okay, huh? Okay, we have covered four out of five properties, but the fifth property, I'll only talk about it later. Okay, so we'll summarize that later as a whole. But what I'm trying to say right now is this. Okay. Gino, you know, we'll talk about that later. Go right now first. Any questions so far? No? Okay, huh? Some other small little things we need to go through first, okay? But some of you guys may be asking, uh, how come it attacks from the back, okay? This is just a property that it exhibits, but at the same time, uh, you cannot attack from the front uh, because there's this whole, whole, this, this whole atom blocking it. Remember, uh, a halogen atom, whether chlorine or bromine, is way larger in size than carbons and hydrogens, agree? You go check the periodic table, right? The data booklet. This guy is way bigger, uh, and because of that, you cannot attack from the front. There's a lot of Objection. Okay, it is blocking the nucleophile's path, so it chooses to come from the back instead. That's kind of like the idea. You're not asked to explain that, but just for your own information. Okay, guys, let's move on to page 22. Okay, page 22, uh, there's a small little diagram here called the energy profile diagram. Just a bit of a kinetic recap. You all know what the energy profile diagram is. You all remember the shape of it. Okay, can you remember the shape? Does it look like that or does it look like that? First or second? What is the energy profile diagram? Any idea what this is? Okay, the answer is the second one. Huh? The first one is your Boltzmann diagram. Remember that? Okay, Boltzmann the explanation. Okay, so this one a lot of people get confused. Huh? They see your see your blur in your copy for her. Okay, so make sure. Axis. Okay, energy axis is on the y-axis. Okay, what's the what uh, x-axis? Okay, for energy profile diagram, this is the progress of the reaction. So reaction progress. Okay. Now guys, how do you draw the energy profile diagram? You see the hump, right? How many humps do I draw for this case? The humps are determined by the number of steps, right? How many steps do I have? One. So I draw one hump. Guys, the next thing is, uh, uh, assume that this is an exothermic reaction. Uh, for good reason, lah. Okay, can you remember the enthalpy change of a reaction? Bonds broken minus bonds formed or bonds formed minus bonds broken? Which one? Okay, good. Broken minus formed. Okay, please think about this. We're gonna like make a smart guess, right? As to why most of these nuclear sub reactions are exothermic in nature. We take a look first. 
Can you tell me what bond is broken in this procedure? Okay, what bond is broken here? Okay, the CX bond, right? Generally, the halogen bond versus what's the bond that's formed here? C oh, good. Okay, and no matter what halogen you use, uh, which one has a stronger bond? Okay, so go and check your data booklet for the bond energy. CO bond is always stronger than any halogen bond. And because this is stronger, uh, your delta H is positive or negative. This is stronger than this. Negative, uh, right? Okay, so most of the time, my uh, guys, the question will not say whether it's exo or endo for a nuclear sub procedure. You can make a smart guess. It is probably going to be exothermic because exothermic makes the compound more stable. By having less energy, you are more stable, right? Now, can you all just tell me uh, what are the things I need to fill in in this diagram? Hey guys, what are the things I need to fill in in this diagram? Details. Any details? Okay, the arrow. The arrow representing what? Okay, activation energy. Okay, good. So activation energy should go from here all the way to the top. What else? What does this and this represent? Okay, the enthalpy change now is going downwards. Okay, so you just tell me enthalpy change is less than zero. Okay, but what do you have to write over here and here? What do these two levels represent? Okay. okay, good. The reactants and products don't just write the reactants and products. Uh. Okay, I want you guys to write the actual reactants. So Br and OH minus eventually it becomes OH and Br minus. But there's one final thing to include also. Any idea what it is? If you look at the, the, the mechanism over here, uh, okay, there's something that we haven't accounted for in the profile diagram. I've accounted for the reactants and the products. I've not accounted for the what? Transition state. And guys, you want to make a guess where the transition state would be? Where else would it be? <clears throat> the start is the reactants, the end is the products. So the transition state must be the middle. Okay, so take a look. Transition state, don't need to draw it out, but just write it at the top, the peak of this mountain. Later, we'll explain a little bit more of this. Okay, so I'll just leave it here first. Okay. So don't forget the transition state, okay, that's part and parcel of the whole process. Any questions so far? Go on. Now the box at the bottom of the page, right? We're gonna ignore this because later, right, we're gonna summarize this in a more concise manner. Okay. But if you were to ask yourself uh, why SN2 are favored by primary halogenal alkanes, we'll eventually answer that with that. Thing at the box, you know, later we will okay. But now just finish copying first, okay. If not, we will once you're done, okay, we will move on to SN1 nuclear sum. Okay, anything to clarify? Okay, page 23, I discussed inversion already. Can okay, you take a look at 24? Again, okay, another five properties. I'm just going to go off the top of my head. Okay, we can compare with the first one. Guys, what does the one represent in SN1? One means one. Okay, good. In this case, I'm going to make equation only as one reactant. Okay, please write it down first because I really do not want people to confuse the one as one step, no such thing. Okay, one means one reactant. So my equation, uh, guys, let's take a look. There's only a halogenal alkane inside. My nucleophile is not present in my rate equation. What does that mean? If I put more and more nucleophile from SN1 reaction, does it become faster? No, it doesn't because it just doesn't affect, right? So guys, think of this, uh, okay? The nucleophile does not affect rate uh, for SN1. Nucleophiles missing here. Okay. On the other hand, SN1 reactions are known as a two-step reaction. Okay, again, the step is opposite Anna, so don't be confused. And compared to SN2, SN2 is favored by primary, SN1 is favored by tertiary halogenal alkanes. 
You may be asking, how about secondary? Secondary will undergo a mixture of both SM1 and SM2. That one we wouldn't know until the question gives you uh, enough clues. Lah. So SM2, uh, uh, secondary is kind of like in the middle. Okay. And so far. Okay, so I'm going to touch on these three first. Okay, then we're going to look at the next one. Okay, can I turn over to the next page? We are going to start the mechanism. Thankfully, uh, guys, the SM1 mechanism is much easier, not as cancerous as just now. Okay, so first of all, I need you to write down the title. And we're going to split this into two separate steps, as what we had just mentioned. Okay, tertiary halogenal alkene. So I just need you to draw this tertiary halogenal alkene here. Okay, hold it. Okay, what's gonna happen in this step? Uh? Okay, is there gonna be a new profile in this step? Okay, there's gonna there's not gonna be a new profile here, uh, okay, because it's just one region in the slow step. So what's gonna happen here is we have this polar bond, uh, and without any propagation, right? It's just going to break this bond. Nothing attacks the carbon. It's just going to break itself. Okay, some of you guys might be asking why. How come it just break itself? Right? Okay, for uh, multiple reasons, uh, but maybe for now, right, the first reason you all can think of is that electrons, are they stationary or are they always moving? They're always moving, right? And because this is a polar bond, the only polar bond, the electrons could at any moment, right, just go too far towards the body. And essentially, it can constitute as breaking the bond. Okay, so this is what happened. That's one reason, but later on we look at the other reason, which is a lot more complicated. Okay, over here, okay, we're gonna have the slow step, and it's just gonna form this. The Br now breaks into what? The Br becomes what? The electrons break and equal towards the Br, so it becomes Br minus. It gains an electron. Remember, gaining electron will give you a negative charge. Losing electron will give you a positive charge. So how about the carbon then? What charge does the carbon have, if any? Okay, plus charge. Because it just lost an electron, right? Now it has only three bonds. So this time it's a plus charge like this. So guys, this right here is something that you're very familiar with, especially in our kids. This is a carbocation intermediate. Okay, this is a carbocation intermediate. So let's just draw that again for the next step. Guys, just now, uh, in SN2, we form a transition state. SN1, we form an intermediate. And guys, that's the reason why, okay guys, intermediates are real. Uh, these things can be synthesized. Although they are very, very unstable in general, it is still possible to get these structures. So, in other words, because you actually form something in between, right? That's why it is a two-step reaction. So it's two-step because it's an intermediate. But just now, SN2 is considered one step because you form the transition state. The transition states are not actually real, so they, you, you don't split it up into two steps. Okay, so that's the idea here. That's the reason why it's step like this. Okay. Now, for SN2, uh, you can see I don't even need to draw stereochemical formula. Okay, but the next thing we're going to do here is just to take our new profile, so OH minus, and then we're going to just affect the carbon straight up. Now be very careful, uh, guys. I want to see a few things. Number one, lone pair must be shown on oxygen. Number two, I want to see the arrow pointing towards the carbon and not towards the positive charge. Please do not point to the positive charge. Huh? What? Are you forming bonds with the carbon or are you forming bonds with a positive charge? I'm sure, I'm sure you can answer that question yourself. Right, okay, so over here, first step, then you will get the final product. As you can see, uh, it's not very straightforward. Probably because there's no flipping involved, there's no stereochemical formula involved. So it's a lot easier. Okay, split it into two steps, and that's the SL1 procedure. Okay. Later, we'll still come back to the idea of why this bond can break itself. 
Usually this doesn't happen, but it happens over here for good reason. Okay, later we'll come back to that. Okay. Okay, so for no questions, okay, again, let's look at page 26. 26, uh, the profile diagram is somehow printed for you already. You okay, not to worry about it. Okay, I mean, you just draw two hands because there are two steps. But guys, one question here, uh, where is the intermediate located? It just describe its location. Okay, what's the location currently? It's in the middle of two hum crack. Compared to the transition state just now, transition state is at the top of the mountain, but this is at the valley of the mountain. So essentially what's happening here, I need to take note. Transition states occur at the highest amount of energy. So they call this energy maximum. Intermediates, on the other hand, they occur at energy minimum. Okay, this one, not much more you need to understand from this. It's just that when you draw the energy profile diagram, just tell me where it is located in. And guys, in actual fact, uh, how many transition states are there in this profile diagram? Okay, take a look at this profile diagram that's printed in your notes, really. I'm not going to draw it up. How many transition states are there? How many peaks are there? There are two peaks, right? So there's actually two transition states that we do not account for in this question. Okay? Transition state only SN2. Uh. Again, there's transition states in a lot of reactions, but we don't account for it usually. Okay? Two peaks, two transition states. One fairly, so only one intermediate, as you can see over here. Can so far? Again, the bottom of page 26 is not supposed to be filled up, but never mind, later we'll still go through it separately. Okay? Now, I'm going to go through 27 and 28, and then we will take a break. Okay, so almost there already. Huh? We're going to take a break in a short while. Okay, now, as I mentioned just now, SN2, okay, you have three, uh, three properties. I also mentioned, huh? when it comes to the stereochemistry, it's inverted. So how about the stereochemistry for SN1? What happens to it? Is it inverted? Clearly not. Huh? I never talked about it for SN1. But in fact, uh, it has something to do with the intermediate, and it has something to do uh, with this particular carbon. So, what I want you all to do, uh, on page 27, draw whatever I'm going to draw on the board in that box. Okay? Now, you might want to make a note for yourself. This box here will not be examinable. Whatever you are going to draw now, whatever I'm going to draw with you guys, do not will not be tested in the exam. Thankfully, uh, because if it's tested, then you need to draw more shit. Okay, all you need to do, uh, guys, is the explanation at the top of the page, which will, uh, which I will go through with you guys later. Don't even highlight. Uh, later, I'll ask you guys to highlight the correct terms. But essentially, uh, okay, let's draw this structure here. This is a carbocation intermediate that is formed from an SN1 reaction. But why I purposely draw three different groups uh, is to show a little bit of chirality. Chiral carbons, okay, you'll see in a bit. Now, can you visualize this compound? Okay, this is a carbocation that's flat, uh, not facing like this. It's flat. Because this bond is facing outwards, this bond is facing inwards. You can see that? So it's kind of like, like this. When you, from your perspective, it's like flat like that. Why is it purposely? Why do I show your flat like that? It's because I'm like, what will attack the carbon? Uh, what will attack carbon? A uh, new group out, right? Okay, now this new group out over here. Do you remember this concept? Uh? Since this is a completely fat molecule, it can attack from either the top or flat, right? Top or bottom. Now, when it attacks from the top and or bottom, what are the chances of it happening? What's the third What key is it? Fighting. Five spool of atoms. No, no, no. And nine passes. Like seven to nine. 
Holy night, morning night. Oh my God. Because you not see Yeah, but the club then acts in Singapore, no vibes on The drinks then acts. Singapore can club, must go other country. Just to know that I don't go. Mask. Okay, mask. Mask. Wait, 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 go. I got lesson. Wait, wait, later, later. Okay, come. Look first. Okay, take a look at this up. What are the chances of it attacking from the top or bottom? Completely flat, no like kings or anything. Else. So if it's flat, there's an equal chance, right? 50 50 percent of attacking from the top and the bottom. Hey guys, when it attacks from the top or bottom, uh, okay, there will be two separate products. They are called in that you must remember. Okay, I'm gonna I have to recap this whole thing with you guys. Uh, you all forgot what all these are already. Okay, now I have two separate in that What are the proportions of these two in that you Assume this top here and this top. What's the proportion? Equal chance of attacking. So what's the proportion here? One to one, right? Okay, so the chances of them happening oh, is one to one. Okay, so I want you all to draw the products. Again, I repeat, uh, it's luckily not examinable. If it was, a lot of people will just cry. Okay, so let's draw the one at the top. Now, let me just show you guys how it is done. Now. When this guy attacks from the top, all the bonds will be pushed downwards. Okay, so when he attacks at the top, all this will push down, push down, push down. Then you slowly fill it in. Now, if you attack from the bottom, Everything will be pushed where? Upwards law. Push up, push up, push up. Now, guys, are these carbons chiral? Yes, right? Okay. Okay, so these guys are by itself, they can rotate plane polarized light. Remember, that's the property of an tumor. But as you all have just said just now, they are in a one to one ratio in the same mixture. What do you call this mixture? How do you describe this mixture? Racemic mixture. Good. Okay, because I need you all to remember the definition of a racemic mixture. A racemic mixture. Okay. Is defined as having equal proportions of two enantiomers. You all can see right now uh, that there are two enantiomers in the same proportions because you attack with equal probability. Right? And just a little bit more details, uh, guys. Racing mixtures, can they rotate plane polarized light? What's the relationship between two enantiomers? This guy, uh, for example, if he rotates plane polarized light by positive 15 degrees. This one will rotate by the other guy. Negative 15, good. The idea is that they rotate by the same extent, but opposite directions. Okay, so if you have two inner tumors, since they rotate plane polarized light by the same extent, but opposite directions, They will eventually what? If you put them both together, what's the overall rotation? Zero lah. They will cancel each other out. So there's no net rotation. PP stands for plane polarizer. In other words, guys, a mixture that has no rotation is also known as optically white. Optically active? Inactive. Okay, good. Now, luckily, uh, you guys don't need to explain on you so much. You don't have to break it down like that. This is just for your own understanding. Okay, I'll show you guys what is required to write out for this and how the pressure will be freeze. Okay, I'll show you how the pressure will be freeze. Huh? And later, I'll ask you to highlight whatever points, that, whatever keywords that are necessary at the top. Okay, so. I want to copy this question also. Guys, the 
the product is chiral, right? It should rotate plane polarized light. But then they suddenly throw the pressure at you, it doesn't actually. Okay, it's because it actually forms a race plane mixture, right? Okay, so to explain this explanation question, number one, the uh, most important thing to highlight, trigonal planar carbon cation. If you do not tell me it's trigonal planar, I'm sorry, you cannot get your one mark. Anymore. Now, why is this whole thing one mark? It's not because it's uh, they are long or whatever. Uh, no, it's because it's, it's, it's small. This is the only thing that can test you for race plane mixture. Go ahead and highlight trigonal planar first. Okay. Because it's trigger the planar carbon cation, the nucleophile can attack from top or bottom with equal probability. And because of that, you form a race wing mixture. That's it. These are the three words. You don't have to break down what race wing mixture is. Three words, huh? This for one mark. If you're lucky, they can give you two marks. It's the same exact explanation. Take one more picture. Okay, because we're gonna do one more thing before we take a break. Or oh, actually, uh, I think we take a break. So the next one is a little bit long. Okay, we take a break okay, uh, for five minutes. Not bad. Five minutes long. Okay, about 7.25, uh, we have enough time. Okay, about eight minute break. Okay, uh, just finish up whatever. If any questions you can ask, I need to take something with us. Okay, draw your SN2 new close up. For this compound involving ammonia nucleophile. Yep. No, we are using NH3 now. Yeah, because there's the peak over there.
I'm going to deny the NAP must come from the entire draw the room there. Use it to attack the carbon from the right? Break this bond there. Yeah, slowly reveal the answers. We can just make sure I'm going to check on the small little details. I'll now draw the transition speed. You remember your slow step? After your slow step, transition state should look something like this. NH3 haven't really formed a bond with carbon, and carbon hasn't really broken the bond with blood. Swap the solid and dash bonds. Okay, swap very young. Now, you can label this transition state if you want. The most common mistake is that you guys put a negative charge here. There should be no charge here. A white. Okay, overall this step is a neutral step. You can see that because we're using a neutral in profile. So here I should still be neutral also. Don't put a negative charge just for the sake of it. As for the earlier example, okay, OH minus has a minus charge. Just like as it joins together, right? It's gonna give the negative charge to the overall species. I feel no. Okay, then. Yeah. Okay, so must be able to adapt, okay, depending on the neutral power. Okay, then of course, in here, okay, then, yeah. Mm. Or the group itself is swap. So the solid become the H, the dash becomes skin. No, do not do that. Whatever you assign at the start, uh, must keep it consistent throughout. So if the solid is the metal group, the solid must be the metal group throughout. Does that make sense? Okay, I think the notes are got a little bit of an error there. Okay, so right, we just follow our uh, our thing here. Okay, whatever that is solid, uh, we'll, we'll just stick with it throughout. Because the thing is, uh, I know there are some schools uh, who are a little bit inconsistent right, with this swapping thing. Some schools, again, as I mentioned just now, do not swap it at the transition state. They swap it at the end, which isn't wrong, but then over here, right, okay, let's just keep to a standard. Once we keep to that standard, right, okay, then we should be safe for pretty much everything else. Okay? Okay, again, just going to tidy up the rest and just quickly stop. Oh, Let's do one more packet. You can able to pass that next. Okay. What's going to happen here is this. Huh? Now it's going to form the bond with ammonia. And then it's going to have the bonds leaning towards the right. And you're going to get Br minus. Did everyone get this? Well, this is not the final answer. See? This is not the final answer. Why? Uh? You all notice an arrow over, over here already when we do this. Now over here, overall is a neutral step. Transition state overall still neutral. But then how come suddenly over here, overall becomes a negative charge step? What on earth has just happened? Why is it like that? Now if you look up, the Br minus is not a wrong one, right? Okay, because it just gained an electron, so it should become Br minus is correct. 
but it has to maintain neutrality. So if this is PR minus, uh, then this species must have a one part. It implies that this species has a positive charge, but what exactly is this positive charge that we have overlooked so far? Which atom over here has more or less bonds than what it should have? Like for example, carbon should have four bonds, what not? You know, there's a certain atom over there that has a positive charge. The nitrogen. The nitrogen must have a positive charge. We will explain why. Uh, okay, many ways to look at this. Number one, nitrogen has four bonds. That's the easiest way. And nitrogen should not have four bonds. The more obvious explanation is this. Can you see uh, nitrogen is giving its lone pair away? It has three bonds here. It's perfect already. But it's giving its lone pair away. And the fact that it's giving away electrons means he now becomes poor. He now has a positive charge. But then, you may be asking me, how about just now? Just now, I have OH minus 1, right? Okay, there's a negative charge also. There's a low no pair of electrons. But when it gives to the carbon at time, right, eventually it forms a neutral bond. Why is that the case? Because we all see, uh, negative charge implies that it has excess electrons, extra electrons. The extra, if you give away, it just becomes normal. Nah. So imagine it this way. Uh, someone who's very rich, he gives away some of his money, he becomes a normal average person, whatever. But this one's a normal average person. He gave away his money and he actually becomes poor. Can you see that? Okay, so that's a rough idea over here. The negative charge means is more his extra electrons. So when he form the bond, he becomes normal. This one low, he becomes poor. So clearly, uh, this isn't the end of the story yet. Let's draw in our final, final product. Hey guys, this step uh, is not part of the one step process. Uh. You can treat it as if this step is an adjustment step. Okay, this is kind of like an adjustment step. Of course, don't write it in your answer. Just showing you guys. Okay, to make sure you get the final product. As we mentioned just now, our nitrogen should have only two H's over there because in this case, it is an amine. It must have only three bonds. So we adjust this first. That means uh, it shouldn't be Br minus, it should be HBr. Okay, why am I going to draw the product first? Right? Because I'm not going to give you all the answer. I want you to tell me exactly uh, how the electrons flow, how the arrows move to give this final answer here. So perhaps to start things off, uh, the NH3, I want you to draw all three bonds. Now that you've drawn out all three bonds, I want you guys to tell me exactly how the arrows move. Okay, come, take a look. Any ideas here? Any suggestions? How are? Okay, guys, you might see these kind of scenarios are like pretty much every exam. Okay, when you may not be very familiar with what you're doing, but yet you still need to come up with a way to get the answer. Now, one way of making your life easier here right, is to always look at the final product. Because by looking at the final product, you know exactly right how the what, what ends up happening. You take a look at the Br minus, eventually it becomes HBr. So what do you think the Br minus does? It attacks the N. Is that the case? Okay, some of y'all will say Br minus attacks the N because bridge attacks the poor. Okay, I get that. However, are you directly attacking the N? Does N bond to Br at the end of the day? No, N doesn't bond to Br. H is bonded to Br. So what should you attack? You should attack H. So give me a lone pair first. I want to see the lone pair. And then this lone pair has to attack this H. So guys, you cannot just stick to the idea of, oh, rich attack poor, rich attack poor. Okay, so you take your rich and attack. No. You must always look at what happens next. And this is a skill that must be developed. Okay? You will definitely see these kind of things in exam one. Okay? I've seen it too many times. People just attack rich and poor without actually looking at what happens next. Okay? Now, yes, you attack this, you can, you can HBR. But what's next? You can see, uh, this is NH3, it has to become NH2. So one of these H's has to break off, right? But break again, then how? Okay, obviously it's this H that breaks up because I attack this guy. Okay. The electrons here just sitting here. The bond doesn't exist anymore, man. it's broken. Then where do the electrons go towards? Exactly. N needs the electrons. He says he's poor. He has a positive charge there. He's saying that I need the electrons. Please give it to me. You're not using it anymore, right? Okay, so just give it back. Lah. The H is gone already. It's not useless. Useless, then just give it back to the N. So now the N becomes neutral once again. So this is the adjustment step uh, that I wanted to go through with you guys over here. Okay, so this is an application already. 
en su favor. ¿Ok? Right. Ok, we have one more little segment to go to. And we're going to use it on this uh, blank piece of paper again, but I want to flip it over or find some space. Okay, there's one more thing we still haven't gone through uh, for both SN2 and SN1. Sorry. Why do SN2 uh, be, why is SN2 favored by primary and why is SN1 favored by tertiary? Okay, you must know how to explain that. So let's read this whole board. Uh. I want you guys to come, kind of draw this table over here. Okay. So this segment, I'm going to call it uh, the preference towards SN2 and SN1. Okay, make sure the table is big enough, you can write some explanation inside. Uh. So I have SN2, I have SN1. Okay. And I have primary halogenal alkenes. Tertiary halogenal alkenes. Let's split the table as such. Okay, let's uh, indicate all our preferences first. Huh? SN2 is preferred by who? Primary, okay, so whoever would think that primary is preferred. But it's not preferred by tertiary. On the other hand, SN1 is preferred by tertiary and hated by primary. Okay, so I'll try to explain why. Uh. Now, looking at SN2 first, you might have seen some this word pop up just now already. For SN2, if you want to justify here, uh, the factor to explain is steering hindrance. Why steering hindrance? Steering hindrance is about the obstruction of space. So more steering hindrance means you're more congested. Less steering hindrance means you're more free, more open. Now guys, why is space important in SN2? Because I already mentioned just now, SN2, how does the nucleophile attack? From the back. So space itself uh, is already constrained. If you have so much space constraints, uh, it cannot attack from the back also. So it must be very careful. Okay, so, uh, steering hindrance, preferred by primary. You want to make a guess, uh, primary, why is it preferred over tertiary? Why is primary preferred over tertiary when it comes to space constraints? Good. Having less groups obviously means you have more space, right? Yeah, that's the answer. Yeah, okay, that's the answer. Okay, so over here, uh, just tell me, uh, primary halogenal alkenes have less bound alkyl groups Hence, it faces less steroid inference. It's as simple as it can be, and that's why it favors SN2 reactions. Go ahead and write the opposite one also. Huh? More bulky, okay, I describe alkyl groups as bulky over here. Okay, more bulky alkyl groups will face more steroid hindrance, which is pretty much less stable. Okay, that's why it doesn't favor SN2. Sounds simple, but let's take a look at SN1. SN1 looks at some concepts that we've looked at before. The factor for SN1 uh, that you want to explain is okay, stability of the carbon cation intermediate. How stable the carbon cation is uh, will determine whether you undergo SN1 or not. So guys, for this, uh, uh, you, let's visualize the carbon cation first. I'm going to draw the primary carbon cation. So only one alkyl group. And the tertiary carbon cation, which has three alkyl groups. Okay. And after this segment, if let's say you need to go, you can, you can go in. This is the last part. Okay. 
Look at the carbon can ions are guys. We are supposed to determine who is more stable. Do you remember, okay, alcohol groups, what effect does it have? Good. Okay, alcohol groups are electron donating. Imagine this, uh, imagine you are this carbon in the middle. You are very poor, you have no money. Do you want one person to donate money to you? Or do you want three people to donate money to you? Which one do you think you prefer? Of course, three people want more money, the better. As a poor person, you want more people to give you money, right? So obviously, the three carbon carbon has to be more stable. How do you explain that? Okay, let's look at some keywords first. Here, yeah, look at this. Huh? Having more, don't describe as bulky, huh? must describe as electron donating alcohol groups. Having more electron donating alcohol groups means the positive charge, huh, guys, become bigger or smaller. Smaller, good. Okay, think about it, huh? The plus charge is big because you're poor. But if more people satisfy your financial needs, you don't, you're not as poor. So the, the plus charge has to shrink. But the word for shrink is to disperse. Okay, remember. You disperse the positive charge to a greater extent. And since it's more dispersed, you feel less poor, that means uh, the tertiary carbon cation has to be more stable. Keywords I'm underlined again, these are very important. Electron donating, disperse, stability. Same thing for the opposite, lah, okay? This one is just less electron donating on ground groups. Okay, less electron donating alcohol groups. Okay, what happened to the positive charge? Is it still dispersed? No? Okay, yes. Okay, guys, you all realize uh, you are still satisfying it. It's better than nothing, right? But it's just to a smaller extent. So please don't use the word intensify. Uh, the opposite of dispersed to make it bigger, intensify. No, you are still making it smaller. But it's just to a smaller extent compared to the tertiary carbon cation. So in comparison, the primary carbon cation is actually less stable than the. Now you might be looking at this uh, and then telling me, uh, isn't this a waste of time? Why not I just write for the positive examples? Okay, you will come to that in a minute. Now I'm going to write down an example of how a question in the exam will ask this. And I want you guys to write it down first. Okay? Why did you write these two questions down first? Sample questions. We're going to see our approach to answering them. We have four different approaches, uh, not, not say approaches, uh, but four different answers that you can use uh, depending on what they're asking for. As you're writing, uh, maybe perhaps you can just tell me which quadrant you will look at to answer this question. Okay? So guys, to answer the first question, uh, which quadrant should I be looking at? Okay, obviously the top right, right? Now they have laid it out over here very nicely, you will answer this. But in the exam, uh, you wouldn't have this nice little table in front of you. And let me tell you guys what some students uh, will end up doing instead. Okay? Why does tertiary halogenal alkene not favor SN1 or SN2? Because it favors SN1 instead. Can we answer it that way? No, uh, are you answering the question? No, you are avoiding the question. It's like, how, uh, why do you like? Why do I not like coffee? It's not because, oh, because I like tea instead. Doesn't make sense. Answer the damn question, right? Okay, I don't like coffee because coffee tastes like shit. Okay, that's how you're supposed to be answering questions like this, same idea. How do you avoid uh, falling into this trap? Okay, to avoid falling into this trap, right? I want you guys to always take a look at what the question is asking for. SN2 or SN1. Now guys, in the question print over there, SN2, uh, what are you supposed to explain? Steric hindrance. Do not make a mention of stability at all. Uh. 
because the question never printed that out at all. On the other hand, look at the second question. Huh? Why does primary not favor SN1? Or don't tell me, oh, it's because it prefers SN2 instead. No, it's because you must see SN1 and tell me, oh, it's probably because okay, regarding stability, uh, it is just not stable. That's why. So you must know exactly how to answer this question without having without drifting away from the topic. Okay. Why does tertiary Rx not favor SN2? SN2 is more stereo dangerous. Oh, it's because it has a lot of bulky groups. That's why it cannot undergo SN2. Over here, SN1. Why does it not favor SN1? Okay, because it's not stable. The carbon carbon is not stable. That's not exactly what realm you're discussing. Okay? So we'll take this down also. Okay, argument questions are we can call this preference or argument questions. Okay, we'll try that in the tutorial next lesson. Yeah, just make sure you don't fall into that trap. Okay, Anna. We have one more page and then we take a short break. Okay, so take a look at 29. 29, I'm not going to write anything on the board. I want you guys to you discuss it together and then you have to write it down yourself. I think it's very useful. Uh, it is a summary of all the SM1, SM2 properties, and then we can just take a break from here afterwards. Okay, since it's the end of a portion. Okay, guys, uh, look at the first one. Rate equation, SN1, what's the rate equation like? Go and write it down. SN2, what is it? Go write that down also. Okay, SN1 versus SN2. Okay, so just prefer, okay, let's discuss it together. Okay, so rate equation for SN1 only has what? Okay, rate equals to K times Rx only. Uh. Okay, but make a note to yourself. Nucleophile doesn't affect the rate. But, okay, you just note it down. I mean, it's your own, it's your own notes. It's, it's going to determine how you're going to study this anyway. Right? Okay, how about SN2? Okay, it's the one with the NU at the back. Okay, nucleophile also. Okay, rate is affected by how much nucleophile you add. Okay. How about stereochemistry? For SN1, what about the stereochemistry? Or SN2, what about the stereochemistry? SN2, what happened? The stereochemistry is... Flip right? Inverted. Okay, so SN2, inversion of stereochemistry. But we're going to put a bracket Y up. Guys, why is that inversion in the first place? It's caused by who? Okay, why did the whole thing flip one, one, one end to the other? It's because the nucleophile attacks from where? The back. It attacks from the back, causing the whole thing to flip. Okay, so right there is because of the real side nucleophile attack. Okay, on the other hand, SN1, uh, what's so special about the, the stereochemistry? You form a what? Mixture. Yeah, okay, you form a racemic mixture. So for stereochemistry, SN1, racemic mixture form. Now, why is there a racemic mixture in the first place? Because what's the shape of the carbocation? Trigger the plane good. Okay, so just right there. Trigonal planar carbocation. And at least, at least you know why, now, right? This is a small little summary table. So when you look at it tomorrow again, now, uh, then you at least know what to start off your answer with. Right? Number of steps. Okay. So number of steps, SN2, how many steps? SN2 it has one step. Remember, it's just opposite. Okay, good. One step. Can you remember why it's one step? It's because we form a what in the in, the, in between. Transition state, which doesn't actually exist, so it's just considered as one smooth step. Okay? 
Let's put bracket transition state. Okay, then uh, for SN1, I'm sure you all know what that is. Okay, how many steps? And tell me, why do you form that number of steps? What do you form instead? Right? Okay, two steps because you have an intermediate, right? You have an intermediate. Okay, last one. SN one favored by okay, tertiary halo genome you know, is good. Why? The tertiary halo genome you know, form the more mm, yeah okay or that in other words more stable carbon cation. Okay, it's all written here. SN two favored by primary because. It has the least steroid inverts. Okay. Okay, we take a short break again. Okay, by 805, we'll come back to continue the rest. Okay. Rest is just small little stuff and then we'll be done with the topic really. Okay, so yeah, I think it's a bit better. Lah. Okay, we take breaks a little bit here and there, right? so we can reset, reset, reset. Okay, then we eventually can build a bit more stamina. You know? Okay, we are done with the SM1 and SM2 mechanism thing. Okay, we're gonna cover a few more miscellaneous parts, not difficult, and then we are done. Like you all see page 30, uh, this page 30 I can cover in a grand total of 10 seconds. Okay, rate of reaction of halogenol alkanes. For rate, uh, we have four, sorry, three different halogens. CL on with time. Guys, which one is the weakest one? One question only. Okay, I. So is it the fastest or slowest? Yeah, that's it. Done. Let's move on. Yeah, it's actually a waste of time. Uh, this one you all must know. Okay, it's just bond strength. And we've gone through bond strength a million times already. So you should know that by now. Okay? Now, what's more important uh, is what we're going to go through on this page 31. Okay, halo genome AWEs. Okay, so we haven't touched on AWEs yet, uh, but remember that we have basically a uh, halogen bonded directly onto the benzene, something like this. Now, the issue is uh, we have two different functional groups here, so there could be some possible reactions. Okay, the halogen, like what we have learned, uh, could possibly undergo nucleosum, right? But at the same time, there is a benzene ring, so it can also undergo one. Benzene undergoes what reaction? Okay, good. Electrophilic substitution. So, the thing is, uh, yes, the benzene can undergo electro sub, but it actually cannot undergo nucleo sub. And our job is to answer why. Now, nucleo sub uh, means you need to replace this CL with OH or something else, but it just can't replace. So, let's think about it. Uh, if you cannot undergo nucleo sub, what does that imply? This bond, what does it imply about the bond? Okay, good. The bond doesn't break, right? And that is because it's very strong. Our job here is to explain uh, why the CCL bond, a normal single bond over here, is so much stronger. In a normal halogenal alkane, it's the same freaking bond, right? How come here it's much stronger than it doesn't break? So that's what we're trying to figure out now. And there are two ways to explain this. Okay, the first way to explain uh, is via the electronic factor. So if you look at the notes, uh, we actually split it. Okay, now if you have to study one of the two factors, it will be the electronic factor. So please put a star next to this. You forget about the second one and you still get close one eye. But this one uh, is the main reason why this thing happens, why the CCL bond is very strong. Okay, so this is what we're trying to figure out right now. So guys, we have, done, we have gone through ARES before. We understand how ARES work. So this is how things go. So perhaps I can draw this diagram and uh, there's a box for you to draw it actually, page 32. Okay, in that box over there, okay, we can draw in this diagram and this is how it's going to work. Okay, I'm just going to draw the, the ARES inside first on the benzene ring. Guys, can you remember uh, every single carbon in benzene, it has a what orbital? A p orbital, good. Okay, a p orbital each. 
What can all these three orbitals do? Will they just stand there and do nothing? They are all beside each other. So what can they do? They will all overlap with one another, right? Okay, so when they all overlap with one another, this is what happens, huh? Okay, this is how the circle in the middle comes about. It's because the pi electrons are, have a pathway to delocalize across the entire ring. Okay, but that's not what we're discussing now. We are discussing the CL, and that CL is bonded directly onto one of the carbons. And just like the carbons, the CL also possesses a, a p orbital. What do you think this p orbital will do? You will also overlap with this guy, right? In fact, you overlap with everyone else. You can think of it in this way: uh, he's joining the family, so now he's part of the family over here. Now, CL has a lone pair, and what, would, what do you think this lone pair will do now? So now that they are all connected, he can go in the, in the ring also, right? So this is an act of delocalization. Okay, so let's look at the explanation behind this, uh, a few points. Number one, you must first tell me uh, the P orbital of chlorine overlaps with the pi electron cloud of benzene. Okay. Now, after it overlaps, it allows uh, a lone pair of electrons of chlorine okay, to delocalize into the benzene. Okay, so remember, uh, delocalization is always required, it requires overlapping P orbitals first. P orbital overlap with the pi electron cloud. Finally, then, we still have not explained why CCR bond is very strong. And I'm going to introduce a new term that we're going to have to use. When the delocalization happens, uh, this causes the CCR bond to have partial double bond character. What the hell is this? The most important forward phrase in this question. Okay, what does this mean? Hey guys, is this CCR bond a single or a double bond? It's obviously single, right? Single bonds generally quite weak. But guys, when you look at a double bond, uh, people as I draw this, a single bond is just made out of one sigma bond. A double bond is made out of both a sigma and an additional pi bond. How do you form the pi bond? How do you form that second bond over here? Pi bonds are formed by a what kind of overlaps? Sideway overlap of the p orbitals, right? You all notice, uh, as I'm drawing this diagram over here, there is a sideway overlap of two p orbitals. Now, in actual fact, uh, it is a single bond, yes. But it has certain characteristics of a double bond. Can you all see? Because there is a sideway overlap of two p orbitals. In other words, uh, guys, double bond is it stronger or weaker than a single bond? Obviously stronger, right? So you can think of it this way. This guy is born as a single bond, but he has some double bond genes. And the gene of a double bond is that he's much stronger. So he isn't actually a double bond. He isn't actually a single bond. He's kind of in the middle. So that's how he gets. But he's partially a double bond. Okay, that's how it works. You can think of it this way, uh, maybe all of us, right, we are Chinese, uh, Chinese our genes, physical genes are not very good. Uh, okay? We only have like maybe the study genes. But then you can think of like, let's say the black people, like American, like African Americans. Wow, they are damn strong because black people is true, uh, okay? not really racist or anything. Uh, they are actually physically stronger. They have physically stronger genes, like they can run faster and whatnot. Okay, so... Because of that, I can think of it this way. Imagine your dad is black and then your mom is Chinese. Okay, so you kind of get the best of both worlds, right? You are literally you are like built stronger. So it's kind of like the same guy over here. Okay, fundamentally, he's a single bond, but he has the strength of a double bond. Makes hybrid. Okay, so think of it that way. Kind of a racist analogy, but uh, never mind. All right, okay, so maybe, let's finish this up. Partial double bond kind of so what? Okay, so he strengthens it. He strengthens. In a CCR bond, making it hard to break. 
And because it's so hard to break, right? You cannot actually undergo the flow sum. This is a more significant factor. Keywords highlighted. Okay, we have answered that question. We're going to look at the steering factor, not as important. Okay, but let's just very quickly go and draw in a diagram to kind of show it, look at it also. Okay, steering just means something about space, constraints, obstruction, whatnot. Okay, and how it works is this. Uh, remember, how does the nucleophile approach uh, the halo genome? Okay, nucleophile usually approaches from the Back, right from the rear. So guys, the back of this CCL bond, uh, you, you are faced with this humongous benzene ring. Okay, you see it's blocking the weight. Okay, and not only that, uh, if let's say a nucleophile is negatively charged, it tries to approach uh, from the back. What do you think will happen here? Nucleophile is rich of poor. Rich. Benzene is rich. So they end up repelling. Okay, so that's the idea here. The incoming nucleophile is repelled away by the okay, so again, incoming nucleophile is repelled away by the high electron cloud of benzene. So this results in your own version of steric impedance. It is not very easy to explain. You can even don't even need to follow my wording word for word. It isn't really just tell me about how it's hindered by the bulky benzene ring, how it was also repelled by the benzene. It is not very simple to understand. We can just quickly move on from here. Okay. Okay, we'll take a look at uh, page 33 after this. Okay, it has something to do with okay. If you cannot undergo the close sub, never mind. It can at least still undergo electrophilic sub. But guys, just a quick question here because we have done earrings once. Let's recap this. For electrophilic sub, uh, is it as easy as as reactive as a benzene ring for benzene? Okay, so this is the question to you guys. Let me just rephrase again. This one versus this one. Who is more reactive? Okay, who? Okay, this is where you need to refer to the data booklet because uh, in Aries, uh, we have learned that substituents can either be donating or withdrawing. They will tell you this in the data booklet and it is seen over here. If you look at data booklet, they tell you that this is deactivating. Deactivating means what? Donating or withdrawing. Deactivating means withdrawing good. So imagine this, uh, this guy is like trying to leech off the benzene. He's trying to steal electrons from benzene. So does the benzene become richer or poorer? Poorer. Okay, let's do that first. Uh. So our explanation is as such. First, you tell me okay, that the CL group is electron withdrawing. Hence, it will make the benzene, okay, the benzene ring, in the halo genome area is less electron rich. Okay, guys, so remember we need to say less electron rich, and we cannot make a mention of the word poor because is benzene ever poor to begin with? No, you must choose your words wisely, must be rich again okay, because benzene is fundamentally rich. So don't use the word poor. And because it's less electron rich, guys, do you think it's more reactive or less reactive? It will be more or less reactive. Yes. Okay, of course, with less electrons in the benzene, you're gonna be react slower, right? Okay, but you cannot just say less reactive. Okay, it's actually uh he's now less susceptible to okay, electrophilic attack or nucleophilic attack.
Okay, filling the blank here. Electrophilic because it undergoes electro sub, uh, which trying to attack electro pulse. Okay, but let's add on a little bit more to this. Guys, the conditions. If you are less reactive, uh, should your conditions be stronger or weaker, milder? It should be stronger, right? To push it to react. Now it's harder for you to react. So your conditions must be stronger. So right, the stronger conditions are required. And what does a stronger condition mean? Higher temperature or lower temperature? Higher temperature. Can you see that? So if let's say you are asked to talk about the temperature, okay, you must add in this last point also. This is more like an earrings or uh, recap. Okay. One final segment and we are done for today. Okay, but end off the link. Okay, we already have this distinguishing thing, distinguishing test thing. The final, final segment, right, is nothing important. Okay, but anyways, uh, Halo Gino earrings, uh, that's it. Okay, there's only like these three, four papers. Yeah, okay, mostly this topic is about Halo Gino alkins. Uh, okay, now let's look at the last and final thing, distinguishing test. Guys, if you want to do a distinguishing test, remember it's all about the observation. Okay, for halogenol alkanes, we have three types of halogenol alkanes. Our job here is to distinguish uh, the different halogens, right? Okay, so what we're gonna do over here? Okay, I know everything is there, but on page thirty-four at the very bottom, uh, let's just copy down the three-step procedure again. So for the distinguishing test, right, it's split into three steps. First step is to add NaOH equals N. We will then explain what the purpose is. The second step is to add okay, aqueous HNO3, or sometimes you can see dilute HNO3. Okay, we're going to explain the purpose also. And after doing all that, then we can add AGNO3. Guys, what do you think NaOH equals and heat up? It's trying to do. There's one reaction and condition that we have learned in this topic. What reaction is this? What's the reaction called in the first place? Any idea? NaOH and heat. The OH minus is a neutral form. So when it comes into contact with all the halogens, it will undergo nucleo sub. So, this first step uh, is a nucleo sub reaction. Why? Because if you take a look at the reaction, uh, a halogen with OH minus will give you the alcohol and X minus. Any idea what the purpose of getting this reaction is? My job is to distinguish the halogen. So, can you see the nucleo sub reaction helps to get the halogen out of the compound? It helps to break the bond from the halogen. So in other words, uh, it liberates the X minus, the halide ion. Because if it's bonded, can you do anything to it? Can you perform any reaction? No lah. Right, okay, so we need to break it first. Then we can perform reactions on the halogen itself. And we can actually skip to the third step. Eh? Okay, so if you take a look, uh, the AGNO3 the AGNO is the react one. AGNO3 reacts with the X minus, right? To form AGX. And AGX is split into all three different types of course. Okay, so we have AGCL, AGBR, and AGI. They all have different colors now. So we can use the color, right? To determine what the compound contains. Yellow, cream, and white. This one, unfortunately, need to memorize. Okay, I don't think it's very hard also. Because you can see it's kind of like a color gradient. White then become more and more yellowish. I could have just done this, but then I still have to add in this second step over here. Okay, the second step has a bit of relevance. 
into what's happening. Before I add a GNO3, I need to add acid. Why do I add an acid? In response to the first step, I have to add an acid. Any, any guesses? Acid is to react what? Not the alcohol. Acid was to react with the base in the first step, actually. Okay, so the acid here is to react with any leftover NOH from step one. But why do we need to do this? Let's go, let, let, let's explain what happens if you don't remove the leftover NOH. If not, the unreacted NOH will form a precipitate, which is AGOH, a brown PPP. Guys, can someone tell me what's so dangerous about this? So uh, you form the brown precipitate, okay, la, whatever. La. What's so dangerous about this uh, in the grand scheme of this factor? This is a distinguishing test. Uh. You have to look at the color. So what's what's wrong with having a brown PPT come out of nowhere? Just ignore it now, right? Right? What's wrong? Guys, you see, uh, you expect to see white cream or yellow. The moment you see a color, you would tell yourself, oh, there's a halogen in the compound. Agree? But what if uh, the compound they are testing uh, looks like that? There's no halogen inside, but you still perform the test. And yet, uh, you still see a brown precipitate. What would you tell yourself that? You would tell yourself, oh, there's a halogen inside, agree? But is there actually a halogen inside? No. So this brown PPT is kind of like screwing up your observations. Okay, so how do we put that into very nice words? This second step is to avoid a false positive test. A very, very useful word. You all know what false positive is, confirm, right? Okay, it's like when you take the COVID test and then they tell you that you're positive. Hey, you shit yourself. But then actually, uh, you don't have your actually sleep. Okay, so it's the same idea over here. You think that it's, uh, okay, the moment you see a color, then you think, oh shit, I have a halogen inside, but actually you don't. So you don't want this problem. Okay? Any questions? So when you were to write your answer in the exam, you have to write step one, step two, step three. Okay, all, all this don't need to write for your own understanding. Can? Can not? Okay, and with that said, again, on the next page, uh, page 35, there is a uh, alternative way of doing this. If you don't want to write three steps for me, right? Okay, can, never mind. You tell me ethanolate AGL3 also can. Okay, ethanolate AGL3, then you heat it all in the water bath. Okay, now this one, right, you will see the colors again, lah, but they also include the time it takes for the colors to appear. Guys, out of the three guys, out of the three compounds here, who is the fastest? Remember the red thing that I went through in like 15 seconds just now? Okay, I. Because why? CI bond is the weakest. The weakest means easier to break, the faster to break. So the fastest you are going to form your yellow PPT. That's why it says that immediately. But AGCL, the strongest bond, takes forever to break, five to eight minutes. Okay? Okay, now. Okay, with that said, uh, we're pretty much done with the set of those really. 36 uh, talks about like in real life, uh, halo, halo, alkenes. Maybe I thought about it, uh, thought, uh, just mention something first. Guys, you all know what chlorofl chlorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorofluorof
they are electron deficient. Imagine uh, a radical over here, CL radical. It, it has one lone electron, a uh, super reactive one. It's so reactive uh, that it will react with the ozone layer if it's all three, all three molecules for ozone. Right. That's the rough idea. Uh. Okay, again, all these equations of page 37, uh, you all don't actually need to know. Okay, don't I also don't know what the hell is going on over here. Okay, page 37, you can ignore 36, nothing much. Uh. Measures to protect ozone layer, appreciate this. What the hell? Why is this even here? So it's bullshit. Yeah, okay. So don't need to study this, but okay. In other words, today we have completed this really up. But again, we can talk about all this for hours, uh, but then if you don't do tutorial, it's pointless one. So next lesson, next Tuesday. I'll see you guys same timing. We'll do the tutorial. Okay, again, before that, uh, uh read through the notes a bit. Uh, don't come in tutorial to know how to do anything. It must at least know what's going on. Okay, so uh can you guys make it because that one is the third day of Chinese video. Yeah. Mm, wait, I say, how early do you want it to be? Like, yeah, the morning. La. Uh, if you all don't mind morning, uh, I'm okay with the morning and so on. Uh, do you all want the morning? Instead, uh, you see, since that day, there's no school, so like, right? Uh, 10 to 12 hours. 10 to 12, how about 11 to 1? I think 10 to 12, I'm 